Hi everyone, I'm Pam Lurkia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Anne Rousseau. Hi Anne. Did Hi. I say that right? Your last yes. name? Yes. yes. <laughs> now an earlier guest on the podcast, Kelly Callahan, connected me to Anne and thank you very much Kelly, that's awesome because it's been my pleasure to explore Anne's online presence and I'm really thrilled that I get a chance to chat with her in person today. Yay. Yay. <laughs> So to get us started, Anne, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Um, I am a mom to three boys with my partner, Tim Russo, and uh, we had three home births. And the three home births, that was a leap to, to go into the home birth world with the first. And mm -hmm. once we went there, we were never going back. Mm -hmm. I was always going to have a home birth. Um, and that led into attachment parenting very easily, which led very easily into unschooling. Mm -hmm. Though, to be fair, I'm sure there are people in my life that have no idea what unschooling is or that I am participating in such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know to the rest of the world it's kind of just you know homeschooling that's that's as much as we need to share right exactly right and that also is a life lesson for me of mm -hmm. I really don't need to overshare with people who aren't interested yeah it's huge yeah that really really is it's I remember at first, you know, you wanted everybody to understand. You wanted everybody yeah. to kind of like, uh, certainly the people, you know, just in the extended family to approve. Yeah. You wanted them to know that what you were doing is right because it, it was, you know, it wasn't until years later that I realized it was more me looking for approval, right? Until I got to the yeah. point where, you know what, I am confident and, and happy with our lifestyle and I'm not going to change it no matter what. And you get to that point where, where you just own it and you don't need to explain it or share it. You just be it. You just kind of live it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a lovely place to be? Yeah. <laughs> In all aspects of our life, we're just living it. We don't have to explain it. There is a level of mastery. Even if mastery may not be the word, it's a level of comfort and security. Com and yeah. here I am. It's me doing this. And I've decided it's okay for me. Yeah. yeah. And I love your point about there's so many different journeys we take, right? I mean, unschooling's one, that's if that's our choice. But I mean, as I get more and more into writing now that my kids are older, I am recognizing those same stages in my journey with writing, journey with marketing, like selling my books and things. Yeah. It, it's 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 I mean, they're different, of course, because they're through that different window, but the general patterns um, of, of the journey are, are very similar. So that's fascinating. We'll touch on that later, I think. <laughs> okay. I have, a, I have something to say about oh, that. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just say it just briefly and we'll come yeah. back around to it. But yeah. um, one of these things and is coming up for me as a parent of older kids, not just the little ones, mm -hmm. and it's it's a question of worthiness and it comes up for teenagers and it comes up for adults, maturing mm -hmm. adults. What is worthiness? Can I ask for what I feel that I'm worth? Am I mm -hmm. worth being a member of this world? Right. And so all of these things start to come up, these issues around worthiness and can I ask for what I really want? And when I look back at some, I, I put together a whole slideshow of just memories with the boys and it, even now, gosh, it makes me cry to, to think about that slideshow. Yeah. It's, it's so, so beautiful. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I oh. mean, I was just looking at this life that they've had, this life of worthiness of it's okay to be a kid. It's okay to be covered in mud from head to toe and completely naked and run around in your bare feet and to be on a computer with your friends and Skyping in at the same time and FaceTiming in and sitting on a couch with boys and iPads and iPods and then being in the middle of the ocean and it, you know there's this amazing wonderful life and it's we're worth it 
had such a great <sighs> word for it. That value, you know, every moment, every choice, you know, whatever's important to us has value. Like, you know, with unschooling, with our kids, that message that they get every single day, like full stop. That's just, I, I got goosebumps again. It's, it's <laughs> one of the reasons why I just love to continue talking about unschooling and yeah. diving into it myself because there's just, just that value of, of living life, not, not achievement, not all those external measures. And that is something that, um, like when we were talking about the different stages, that value, that worthiness, um, you know, we go through it when we first start unschooling, I think so much, um, because we're so used to measures, right? We're so used to being graded. We're so used to comparing, you know, ourselves to anyone else that, you know, that's the first layer of worthiness. I think when you first uh, start unschooling, like there's so many layers to peel away on, on underneath all these ideas, isn't there? There's so many, so many, even when um, my midwives were leaving us with our first baby, (laughs) I was sort of like, whoa, 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 am I going to do it right? (laughs) Like, I just need the rules. And (laughs) and my Dear midwife Ellie said, you make the rules yourself. You are the authority in this situation. You know, she wanted it to come away from her, to come Mm -hmm. away from anything else. She says, she gave me this, um, she bestowed me motherhood in that moment and said, this is yours. And and you get to decide how this deal is going down. (laughs) (laughs) and it becomes such a relationship inside of a family that the family decides together so many ways that this deal is going down Woo! because no one person in the family makes steers the ship completely everybody has a say even if it's a passive aggressive say everybody has a say in how the family is going to go mm-hmm yeah. Um, and so that's pretty interesting too, because even if I had, I didn't have my way with everything of how everything was going to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, but that also is a beautiful learning to what is it like to live together? What is it like to slog along together or walk at the pace of the slowest one in the family? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Doesn't it feel like like you as a person, like as I imagine that feeling, you're you're just bigger. It just encompasses you, me, like encompasses everyone in the family. And it's like like all of our needs are just so um valuable and and figuring it out. And it's so I don't feel like I'm giving up when I'm walking slow. When I'm walking mm. as slow as the slowest person, it doesn't feel like I've given up something or I've, I don't know, what's the right word, you, you know, that, that I'm, oh, that's all I can come up with right now. Well, that you're sacrificing your pace. Sacrificing. There you go. Yep. That's a great word. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not sacrificing for it. There's yeah. beauty there. I it, All it means is I'm shifting how I'm looking at the situation. Oh, okay. We're going to go a lot slower. I'm going to see different things now. And you come to appreciate whatever, um, wherever you find yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. And that is the real flexibility and the strength of being able to shift like that. Mm -hmm. As As the mother, I'm just speaking because as a mother, there's this incredible... Uh, strength in flexibility in in softening and getting bigger to encompass and hold the space for everyone. Mm, yeah, that's a great. I point. don't always do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how many times do we see we're not perfect? You know, how do you think you learn these things? Because you try other ways and they don't work as well. And yeah, and sometimes you just have to. And like that's one of the things too that it was from an attachment parenting book that I read, um, attachment across the life course. We did a book um, episode on it, and he uh, talked about how you know fifty percent almost of our interactions don't go the way we wanted or the way we expected, and the whole point is is the coming back to it right? Yeah. It's, it's the reconnecting. It's that's what builds so much trust, you know, and connection in the relationship. Because when 
when we make a misstep, we still come back. We come back to it. We don't hold grudges. We don't feel, you know, you know, we, that's our work. <laughs> You know, that's our work is the reconnect. reconnecting. Yeah. 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 And yeah. making the space for all of those things which may feel like mistakes or they may feel just rotten, mistake yeah. or not. They just yeah. don't feel great. Feel right. But yeah. then the reconnecting, especially when it doesn't feel great, is especially even better. You yeah. know, that when you're able to reconnect in a time when it seemed impossible, then that reconnection is deeply strengthening for a family, for relationships. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I should probably go back to our questions. Okay. <laughs> or we'll just stop for now. But, um, I did just want, um, you talked about how you went from attachment parenting into unschooling. So if you could just maybe give us just a little bit of history, like um, did you hear sure. about unschooling from uh, an attachment parenting group or, or how did you first hear about it? I, I think I first heard about unschooling and, it, and I had a judgment about it right away. I was like, what do you mean unschooling? That just, <laughs> I, I didn't understand. Um, and I'm trying to remember how, I think Sandra Dodd was my first peek into unschooling and I got her book, the big book of unschooling. Mm -hmm. um, and that was when I really started to understand the philosophy, understand really what was going on, that it was so much bigger than school you know, I wish we could take school out of the picture. Yeah. It's just yeah. this huge experience of unlimited learning. How can you take learning and make it personal and individual and unique and absolutely unlimited? And then it feels like, well, that just sounds like a good life. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Because that's where you get Our, to, right? A good life. Yeah. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what everyone wants, no matter what choices they're making. They're making it because they're hoping for a good life or they're hoping for happiness. But unschooling g offers this window into it at a very early age. I feel mm -hmm. like you don't have to wait. You don't have to. We spend so much time talking about de-schooling. How great is it for my kids to not have to ever go through de-schooling? Yeah. <laughs> they, they have to go through de-momming, de and Rousseauing. I'm sure I've <laughs> done something to them <laughs> at some point, but we'll leave that for well, yeah, yeah. their generation. <laughs> uh, my husband is a furniture maker, and he was asked to teach in Australia when my oldest was five. Mm -hmm. And so we were going to be in Australia for what ended up being a semester of school when he would have been in kindergarten. And I already knew that I wanted to homeschool. That's what I was calling it. That's what I was thinking. Yep. Um, and I didn't quite know how to tell people. But the fact that we were traveling that year was so easy and it made it so simple to say, okay, this is what we're doing. That's why I'm not enrolling him in kindergarten like my other friends are yeah. doing with their children at the same time. And so that was my window in, even though I never really had any intention of, of go, right. sending my children to school if it was my choice. Um, so we went to Australia and traveled and had a great time and met homeschoolers there uh -huh. who I, some of them were unschoolers as well. And that was mind blowing. And Australia is a lot more rigid about their schooling. They're a lot more, um, the, 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 socialized around it where it seems very important to many people that kids go to school mm -hmm. and so these homeschoolers were real renegades over there they were wild and and powerful you know when you have to push that hard against something then you become very powerful they were very powerful and inspiring and I came home and that was sort of it for me that I was just on the ball and looking at all kinds of things in the beginning, there was a bit more of me working through some of my de-schooling, being more schooly. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. um, and that started to fall away the more I read about unschooling. I got on some forums. I, I sort of soaked it all in as much as I could and kept opening and opening and opening. Um, and my oldest is um, 
it, it just has an incredible mind and ha um, it's sort of like an engineering sort of mind mm -hmm. and really loves figuring things out. So he was a really great kid for me to watch things happen without me having to do anything. Mm -hmm. Just stringing things up and tying things around and making things and digging holes and doing experiments. And he really had a lot of energy that, that really showed me that, wow, a lot is going on if you just open the door. Yeah. You know, I think that's one for me anyway, that was a huge piece of understanding unschooling, like along with the, all the reading I was doing and, um, is watching conversations, you know, in forums and email lists and stuff like that. But then watching my kids, like mm -hmm. seeing them in action. Um, and yeah, the different personalities too, right? Like the time to realize, you know, the ones that are more thinkers versus the ones that are more hands-on. Mm -hmm. But over, you know, a couple of months, you can see the result of all that thinking they were doing, like through their conversations or just through what they're choosing to do next. You go, Oh, so you from to go from here to here, you were thinking about X, Y, Z, probably, you know, you get yeah. a good idea to see how they, how they go about it. And that helped so much to um, see in action what I was reading, right? Like, it was important for me to understand the theory and the philosophy and, and how the, what the more experienced unschoolers were saying was going to happen and how their kids learn and stuff. But then to see it in action and to have my own examples that really, you know, that's how it started to solidify for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you how far I've come. One of the first things that I remember doing in an active forum, maybe you would have been part of this. Sandra had this like chat room. I can't mm -hmm. remember what it was. And 15, 20 people tops would come in and chat for an hour, just like, um, instant messenger kind of chatting. Yeah, yeah. I came in for the first time and I was like, I was one of those people who came in with, and said, yeah, but what about brushing their teeth? Kids have to brush their teeth, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everyone was so kind to me and they were like, well, let's, let's pick this apart. They didn't, nobody gave me the shake their head or whatever. It was just like, okay, let's take a look at this so that you can have a chance to think about your thinking so philosophical, so heady, some of these things. Yeah. And it was like, well, you know, do you believe that if a child ate an apple, would their teeth be cleaner after? Could your child eat an apple instead of brushing their teeth? Especially young kids who are not that great at brushing their teeth. It's like, ooh, an apple might be better. Mm -hmm. um, and could they swish with something? Could they rub their teeth with a washcloth? It's like, wow, let's pick this apart and see how creative we can get to solve a problem. And I thought, I love these people. I always want to think like this for every problem that comes up in my life. And it just really s swung open this light in my mind of, wow, there's never one way to solve a problem. Oh, I love that. That's such a great example. And that's why it was so important for, for my journey anyway, to um, continue doing that reading and, and participating. And because, um, my mind grew so much. And as you said, realizing the creativity and the, the fact that there is more than one way, you know, from that, that let me be less directed in my kids. And then I saw them doing it different ways and it working out for them. Like I would never have done that in that situation, but it worked beautifully for them. It's like, Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I have this background of being a dancer and when you're practicing improvisational dance or improvisational anything, music, mm -hmm. acting, you're not looking for the same way that anyone else would find their yeah. way to solve a problem. You're looking for new, innovative, unique, and individual solutions from A to B. And that is the goal. That's, that's the you know, preciousness of the situation is that it will not look the same as the person next to you. And that's what you do it for. And I thought, well, I love that about life. Aren't we meant to be here to do it just our way in just our expressiveness? Why would I want my child to solve two plus two equals four exactly the way I do it? There, there are actually more ways to play around with how you get to that answer. Mm -hmm. It's not just cut and dry. 
Mm -hmm. As, uh, you know, I love the word tricky math these days. <laughs> it's like, for me, sometimes math changes the way I think about a subject, the way I look at the numbers. And this, this is just maybe an aside, but I was thinking of my own worthiness piece of what rate do I want to charge for something mm -hmm. in my life? What's my worthiness? And then I was like, well, I'm not comfortable asking this rate. It's, it's, makes me squirm. But if I do a little tricky math and I get the rate and I change the time and I make an equation that works for me, then all of a sudden I've found the solution for myself where I'm getting my rate, but I'm asking for something that sounds less for less time. I, I, I'm getting tricky, really, really tricky here with my math. But I'm trying to explain to you that, that using all of these ways to um, come to the answer that, that feels right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And math always is like, no, there's a right answer. But it's like, well, <laughs> how you get there also matters. There's feeling to it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> um, I think we have touched on this a little bit, <clears throat> but I want to dive in as we're de-schooling. Um, one of the things, well, and beyond, because as we mentioned earlier, <laughs> I think yeah. before we started recording, <laughs> This goes on for life. But anyway, um, it can be especially hard to sit with discomfort and fear to learn what we can learn from it and what we need to move through it. And there is this big, big chasm between that moment, you know, when we know we don't want to do something and then figuring out what we want to do instead, right? There's that, there's this time of inaction um, very often when we're trying, when we're, we have a fear, um, we're scared and sitting with that, um, can be, can be really challenging because change is hard. I, I'm thinking, you know, um, even, you know, whether it's parenting things or, or just re-understanding new, new paradigm shifts. I mean, there's so many paradigm shifts as we start to learn about the unschooling lifestyle. Um, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what you found helpful for yourself during those times. For me, initially, I, I have a sort of personality that wants to solve problems really quickly. Mm -hmm. I don't like that uncertain time or I haven't in the past. So I would get real, I would brainstorm really quickly and say, well, we could do this, or we could do this, or we could do this, or we could do this, and what do you want to choose? Kind mm -hmm. of like that. Or, or like somebody would be having a hard time, say, putting their shoes on. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. It would be like, well, you could wear the, then you could take these shoes that just slip on, or you could take these, or you could not wear your shoes, and let's go. Like, I had this quickness about me that is overwhelming when you're a child that's just sort of in the moment. And I thought that my solving problems – and having multiple, even though it wasn't every solution, I would have multiple solutions to a problem. And then I would want to just skip over that uncertain part. And then the more I unschooled and the more I parented and the more mature I got, I started to understand that there is value in this space of uncertainty that allows the, those feelings to just arise and be there, be present in that uncertainty discomfort, mm -hmm. pain a lot of times, yeah. sadness a lot of times, and let those feelings have a place. There was so much of me wanting to push them aside because they were unpleasant yeah. for myself and for my children. Mm -hmm. So especially um, since losing my hair because of alopecia in the past two years, I got to experience just very personally, oh, here's change again. Yeah. This is change. I don't like it. Oh, yeah. I hate this. But this was, I, there's nothing I could do about it. I knew my hair was going to fall out. This has happened before. And, and I could, but it wouldn't change. So I had the opportunity to get really creative. Yeah. So I had the opportunity to get really creative with it and to, uh, well, my creativity was like, hey, let's make a documentary film about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that um, gave me some real inspiration to 
look at, to really just look at it. Like, what is this? Could this be beneficial for someone else to see me go through loss and change? Um, and then it gave me a way to look at it differently. So as change comes up now for me, I feel myself being more willing now as an older person. I'm not that old, but I am <laughs> older than I was. Um, to see what is the wisdom of feeling the feelings, especially the unpleasant feelings. And when you really feel the unpleasant feelings, then when the sweet one comes in, it's like, oh, that tastes so good. <laughs> uh, so there's just a real appreciation for all of the variation for me. And hopefully I am transmitting that somehow to my children. Yeah, no, uh, well, I think, I think kids can, they pick up a lot of that, a lot of the energy, you know, they can, um, they can feel our unspoken words so often. Yeah. I mean, and all kids can, I think I don't, I mean, I know unschooling kids. Um, what's beautiful is that they feel more um, open and free to, to say something, you know, your, your kids come, can come up and just, just say, Hey, you know, do you need a little bit of time? <laughs> Yeah. Or do you need a little bit of space or do you need a hug or, you know, anything like that, which may not happen in other families. But um, I do think kids can pick up this underlying um, sense of what's going on with us even during those times. So, yeah, I think I, I do think that's one thing that's been really valuable for my kids growing up is problems don't seem insurmountable. As in, I know when my kids have come to me with, with when they're um, feeling uncomfortable about something or they're upset about something and they have no clue how they're going to move forward with it, but there's always the underlying knowledge that there is that other side, mm. that they will, you know, get through it somehow. They just don't know how yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that's something that's really valuable. And I think a lot of that is because they've seen us, you know, take that on. And, and when they're, when they're younger and we're helping them process it, right. We are um, holding that space for them. We don't, if, if we don't break down and join them in this pit of despair, but we validate it and we know it and we understand it and we can empathize with them. But we're also this rock in that we know there's, there's another side and we help them through it. And they go through that enough times as children that that's just what they know, right? That's their knowledge of, of how they can get through something even if they don't know how yet. And yeah. like you say, I, I, I'm older too. And, and I still, I mean, we all come across these situations where I have no idea where this is going to go. But I know it's yeah. going to go somewhere. As a young mother, and I just had one at the time, and I think Noah would have been a toddler. So say he was a year and a half mm -hmm. or two. And I had this cat food, which is where I always had it before I had kids on this toddler shelf, this shelf that was toddler height. Yeah, yeah. And so, but I wasn't going to move that cat food because why would the toddler have to throw the cat food all over the floor? <laughs> so... Noah threw the cat food all over the floor, and I was like, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, this is such a mess. I can't believe it. I was crazed. And my solution was, I am going to pick every single little tiny piece of cat food up and put it back in the dish. And I was going to be calm about it, even though I was angry. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I was like, wow, I'm really learning something. Look, Noah, look how we put the cat food back in the dish. So we sort of did that together. And, and I put it back in the same spot. <laughs> Who's the dummy? I put it back <laughs> in the same spot. So Noah's like, well, that was fun. Let's do that again. Yeah. <laughs> But we were trying to get out the door somewhere at the same time, and he threw the cat food all over the floor. And this point, I was just like, oh, I can't believe how angry I am. I could not get over my anger in that moment. Yeah. And that was the beginning of me really learning about mothering, him seeing anger, me learning, like, you don't do that to yourself. You don't put the cat food back in the same spot if you don't want to clean it up again, you know? <laughs> So for me, this has been this huge learning experience 
right alongside my children. And my children are so much wiser than I am. Right. They, they, even in that moment, if they come across that, they'd be like, well, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Of course I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> they would find another spot for the cat food. Yeah. That's such a revelatory moment though, isn't it? Mm. You know, when you realize, oh, you know, we're back to, there's more than one way to do things. Right. 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 Right yeah. back to that. Not just, okay, this is where the cat food is. This is where I've always kept the cat food. So of course, this is where the cat food goes. <laughs> That's where I was. I've come a long way from that day. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. And now I'm with other people. It's so easy for me to say, well, there's lots of solutions. Hey, I, I pretend like I was never that person in my mind. There's so many places you could put the cat food. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I see that with my kids, with their, their friends, you know, as they got older and stuff. And, you know, maybe I am picking, picking them up, you know, from wherever they are. And that you just see a group of, you know, there's a few of them hanging out. Or I hear a conversation when they're at our house or something. But I hear my kids being that person, being able to take, well, what did you want to do? And what did you want to do? And, and how about we do this? And, and being able to find that path yeah. um, that meets everybody's needs, uh, you know, as, as closely as you can, but somewhere where everybody can like say, either say, yeah, I'm good with that. Or, you know what? No, I'll go off and do something else, whatever. But yeah, yeah that, that ability to see so many different options yeah. Um, and that's something yeah. that's a skill that they, they bring forward with them that's useful and helpful forever. Right. And having a lot of time and space around living gives you the opportunities to, to use your mind to create a lot of different solutions. One of the things that I'm so grateful, and my husband talks about this all the time, is how we have avoided the morning stress routine that so many of our friends have because kids have to be to school so early. Yeah. And so we'll have, in a three month period of time, we'll have one or two mornings where we've got to get up, get some lunches made and get somewhere early. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's stressful and it's yeah. not fun. <laughs> and we all look at each other like, Whew. what would it take away from us to have to do that every single day? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and I looked at my son this morning, waking him up and he, I, it was my birthday yesterday and I had a birthday party and oh, we had a lot of fun. Birthday. Thank you. <laughs> and, and he was, he went to bed late for him and he was really tired this morning and he just slept in. And I just, I just looked at him this morning and I thought, thank God I don't have to wake you up. That you yeah. just get to have that human experience of sleeping until you wake up on your own. Mm -hmm. What a childhood just that, to yeah. have many, many experiences of sleeping until you wake up on your own. Yeah. It's big. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've never thought of that, you know, as in com comparison, like I, I always think of it, well, you know, it, it, how great that they can, you know, do what works for their body, right? What, yeah. what works for them and learn that, like taking that mm -hmm. knowledge with them. But yeah, what, what a gift. I never, you know, it is, it, it is a it gift. Terms. It really, really is, isn't it? Yeah. It's like this, um, it, it's a kind of gift that you cannot buy of offering someone a life that has less stressors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More space. It's sort of like sometimes we talk about our life being a vacation, which probably just has a lot to do with the fact that we don't have a lot of money. So <laughs> going to Hawaii is out of the question for us now. So look at our life as our vacation. Isn't that nice? But sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes it feels like what a luxury to be able to see you right now, to have lunch with you right now, to sit on the couch right now with you, to walk outside, to say, hey, let's go lay out under the stars right now. There's so much space and flexibility by choosing this lifestyle that feels <laughs> did we get cut off there little... just just for a little second okay but that's fine <laughs> yeah um and i i was just gonna pick up on that yeah it, you know what i thought of while you were talking was um 
because because you know when when people talk about oh but you know they they need to be able to wake up yeah you have to train them to wake up and to follow this because you know life isn't easy and and you know they have to learn these things growing up but that's something that we truly experience like life has enough things that go wrong that we don't truly don't need to create these stressors or these um st stressful moments or or schedules for them yeah. to follow it's like they don't follow a schedule growing up they'll never be able to do it i mean it's just so blatantly blatantly wrong you know when when you see your kids in action because you see them wanting to get up for something or you see them wanting yeah. to stay up late you know to celebrate a birthday you know, there are so many real life reasons that you're going to be doing all these things that you don't need to put a, a framework on top of a child just to train them yeah. you know what i mean yeah and, yeah. and that's something that's that that most people just don't get they really truly feel like you need to train yourself to do these things but there are so many other reasons that life provides just for for doing them isn't there there are yeah so many reasons i think of for myself when i um when i first had kids i would wake up in the morning and sing the mr roger song it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood a yeah. beautiful day for a neighbor and a part of that was because i was tired I didn't know how to be a mother. I didn't know who I was. My identity changed completely. And I was not, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was a little depressed. So I would mm -hmm. wake up and I would sing that to myself. Like, this is a good thing. To, Mr. Rogers was always good to me. This is a good thing to sing. And um, all these years later, so now 13, 12, 10 years later, I, it's taken me all of this time to really wake up and be like, embody that wow it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood mm -hmm. it's a beautiful day where are my neighbors where am i in space and time what's going on what's the season going on and to really take that in and be excited about it and i don't know why i hadn't experienced that before in my life but i don't think it helped that i didn't really have a choice when i woke up or what i was going to do for my day and now more than ever i feel like i've got all of these choices in front of me and i sure hope that my children are able to feel that in their life of oh what does this day have for me this is a good day do you know what yeah and and we used to talk about um, you know, when they were younger, we'd get up and we'd be like, what are we going to do today? You know, what adventures do you want to go on? Such that it really surprised me. Um, I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, but my daughter, when she turned 18, she got a tattoo, a small tattoo. And it said, find adventure. Hmm. And, you know, that it was like, oh, you know, that's just how you approach your life now right <laughs> so sweet yes yeah, it was yeah. a, it was a thing for her i mean and obviously moving forward anyway yeah. um i should get to the next question yay okay uh you have three boys as you've mentioned yes and i mentioned up top that it was uh, kelly callahan who mentioned you to me um and in her little note that she sent me, which was beautiful, she described your home as unschooling magic. <laughs> oh, and I'd love to hear how you approach your days with an eye to cultivating that thriving, magical, unschooling atmosphere. I think the primary magic that Kelly might have been talking about is the, um, we have this thing that we call the digging garden mm -hmm. that started off for me as the children's garden and it was going to be a sweet fairy garden <laughs> and it I think I had one year of it being like here are some scarlet runner beans and some marigolds and some potatoes and tomatoes and it was cute children's garden and then the very next year it was the biggest hole that my son Noah could dig <laughs> And it has become called the digging garden. We realize he needs a place to dig. This is what this kid needs. All the kids that come over to our house are like, what is that? That's amazing. And, and he's inspiring and they join in and it's become 
a bunker at one point. At one point, it was, there was a teepee there. At one point, it was a giant hole. At one point, he dug a big square, put a tarp in and filled it with water and made a swimming pool. I mean, this would be like sort of inspired by Noah, but everybody joins in. Yeah, yeah. At one point, it was a construction site with roads going all around, up and down. And um, that, and then there would be experiments with that area. Like one time we figured out how to dig a rocket stove into the side of it, um, made a little cob structure in it at one point. So it has become something different every year. And that, I've never really met anyone with a a dirt digging garden. I don't think in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's been like an outdoor, I mean, it's like a giant sandbox, but it's dirt. And, mm -hmm. and that sort of has spilled over into every area of our life of how can we do what we want here? How can we explore here? How can we get really messy here and then clean it up? And what happens if we heat this up? And what happens if we add water to this? You know, I at one point bought a 50 pound bag of baking soda and gallons of vinegar just because that was what was interesting at that time. Yeah. One time we wanted to know if we could walk across cornstarch. So I bought, I think, 15 pounds of cornstarch and put them in a tub and we experimented with that and then experimented with what what happens with that when you just leave it out it gets really really stinky and moldy <laughs> <laughs> my husband is incredibly um creative minded able he, he's a very, very capable maker, fixer, doer, creator. And so he's been really instrumental in getting the boys working with wood, welding, playing with fire, using all kinds of materials um, that, that that real partnership for, between the two of us is a real boost to the boys having each of our strengths. Mm hmm Oh, that sounds lovely. When you're talking about it, and, and you use the word explore, you know, as I was thinking, you know, as she described that unschooling magic, it sounded like such freedom to explore, right? To just experiment, yeah. to play, to figure things yeah. out, just to, like, there's your space. And then, <clears throat> like you said, you take that experience and you see how, how um, fun that is how connecting that is and started bringing it to the rest of your lives too. just that sense of let's just try this. Let's just explore. Yes. Gee, I, what, I wonder what happens, you know? Yeah. Just yeah. that whole way to approach your days, right? Mm -hmm. huh? I wonder what, I wonder what would happen. We did this thing with some friends of ours where we wanted to have an adventure. So we said, okay, we're going to get in the car in the minivan. So we mm -hmm. filled the minivan and we're like, everybody gets to choose right, left, or straight at every intersection. And let's see where we get to. <laughs> and that has been a really fun way to explore our area, our state, you know, just to be like, we don't know what's going to happen. Let's see what, what happens. And it's that same mentality that you're talking about is, oh, there's a lot worth exploring and spending time with. And it really matters how you approach that. And sometimes it's fun to know exactly where you're going and make a plan and get there on time. And sometimes it's fun to meander and find things you've never found before. And mm -hmm. that is, can be a lot of learning is meandering. Yeah. Yeah. I think we talk about that a lot on the podcast, just being open to seeing where things go. And like you said, it's, there are times for, for different approaches, right? You know, you, something's open, you want to go there, you know, you've got that time structure to your day, you know, we, we get up early and make our lunches and, and off we go. But it's just as valuable. Those other moments are just as valuable, right? The open, the curious, let's just see where this takes us. And so often, it's, it becomes just as valuable and just as fun as all those times we planned out. You know, right. It's not, right. it's not, oh, we're doing this because we have nothing else to do. No, this is as valuable too, just to hang out and mm -hmm. see what happens as it is to have a plan and go do X, Y, Z. Yeah. Yeah. What a great thing to understand about life in general. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. And yeah. reminding yourself about that because sometimes we get caught up, you know, 
in in the plans that we want and we want yes. to go faster <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. uh, absolutely um so i was curious what has surprised you most so far about how unschooling has unfolded for you guys i think for me at this point in my journey what i have been surprised about the most was how much i had to let go and then how much i had to also insert back in once i let go there was also places that it was okay for me to get back i, I was almost afraid at a certain point to mess it up mm -hmm. and and insert myself too much and what surprised me at this point is how I have inserted myself with my children, as partners with my children. Um, and it's sort of like I stepped way, 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 way back. And then as I come back in, I can do it with more uh, partnership or equality or understanding of, okay, now I really see you. I really see that you've got this goal and I can come in and help you with this. My oldest son, um, I don't know if he's dyslexic, so we never would have had a diagnosis at all. But, but he has what I would think is dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And certainly my brother did and my father did, and it runs in my family. Um, and reading just was not coming easy to him. It just wasn't coming easy. And here he was 11 and then 12, and it just wasn't coming for him. And I had sort of was like, I'm hands off. I don't know. I'm hands off. And then he came to me and he was like, I really want to, I really want to try to figure this out. And we found this program that was brilliant. I don't know what they did, but I had never heard of anything like that before. They used these pictographs that represented sounds and it just helped him decode in a way that was smooth and easy and comprehensible. And it's something that I would have been in the early years, like, you're going to have to do this and this. Yeah, yeah. This is my idea. And I, I had dropped all of that. And I was like, okay, somehow, some way, by the time he's 18, he's going to read. It was one of my big fears mm -hmm. around unschooling. And then as we both approached the problem together, and I was able to research and find this program, and then he was able to put his mind into the and desire into doing that then we came together in partnership and it just started sort of magically unfolding for him um, and that was one of my huge fears was how are we going to get something to happen like that if it doesn't seem like it's happening naturally or easily um, and it helped me look at reading with the other kids and realize that it doesn't have to be absolutely completely hands off if you look at what they are wanting and then supplement that with what you know as a partnership, not as a dictator. And so with the other boys, I've been able to look at their style of wanting to learn to read differently and support them in this easy and loving way where always before it was me just being afraid, like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. <laughs> What do you mean you don't remember what mm is? <laughs> you know, it was just so much fear on my part. And so for me to come in at it, like, I don't need to be afraid. I need to be open to seeing what is right in front of me. What is the truth here really? And the truth here really is that we can come together and be partners and solve a lot of problems and meet a lot of goals together and keep fear, you know, aside put it on the table i love that you know and that ties back to that question we were talking about earlier too right about fears so often um when we're fearful of something we pull back from it yeah right? like you were saying and and especially if we think um when we're seeing things as we do at the beginning as hands off right because yeah. we need to get to that point because at first we thought hands on, we should be directing everything. Right. Right. So to stop that, we pull back, right? Yeah. We don't know what we're replacing that with yet. We're like, right. okay, I know I'm not doing that. I know I'm not going to be directing them and, and putting them through my paces to meet my expectations. Um, and I think what develops in that hands 
hands off, but I think we're, that's also a time when we're learning a lot about unschooling and we're more watching our kids than directing them. Yeah. Right. And I think what starts to develop there because we react when they come to us, right. And we help them and we support them. I think what's building in there is trust between us. Right. And then with that trust, then we realize that's when we can come back. Right. Because that when they trust us fully and completely, that's when we can be partners. Whoa. Right. Yes. I, I don't know. This is hitting me like this is a big, big, big deal. Yeah. And it's not, not just in unschooling, but in close relationships. Yep. You know, so there is a huge coming around of trusting. Yeah. Trusting. Yeah. And then, then when your partners, it, it doesn't, then you're just working with them. You're yeah. just trying to help them meet their goals. And if it's, you know, I really want to figure out how to read if we can, if we can try and find something, you know what yeah. I mean? If we can find a way, it doesn't have to be something. Sometimes I know with my kids, it was, you know, stages where we spent more time playing reading kinds of games and noticing um, reading uh, yeah. words. Uh it was just a time when we pay more attention to it in our lives, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but there are other things where there's more other kinds of formal supports, you know, outside helps, whatever it is. But it's, again, it's, it's completely different because it's not us imposing it. It's us saying, hey, I found this. There's this possibility if you want to pursue it and we bring the knowledge that we have as much as we know about it. And then we can explore it with them yeah. and have these conversations to see if it connects, if, they, if they're engaged, if they want to keep going, and, and, and them approaching it and using it the way they want to, right? Like you said, he right. was, he was right. so engaged with it and enjoying it, you know, and maybe he didn't and you moved on to something else. But we're never taking um, agency away from them or control, right? right? And but before, now we're taking more hands-on helping. Yeah. Before, for me, it was like I was inserting my expectations, mm-hmm. even though I didn't want to. Yeah. I, I, that was just my sort of mode of operation or old family pattern of how do you become a mother? How do you do this? You insert expectations and then show them how they're not meeting those expectations, <laughs> which feels horrible in relationship. Nobody yeah. likes that. And nobody really likes being told what to do, to be honest. When somebody, even when I'm like, oh, I don't feel so good. And then one of my kids even, or my husband is like, well, you know, you could do this or this or this. I'm kind of like, I just want to feel bad for a second. I don't want to know how to fix this. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to share that. (laughs) I don't don't need directions. You know, I've gotten to a point sometimes, you know, with my husband or whatever. It's like, you know, I want to, I want to share something but I don't need help fixing it. I know mm. I'll fix it after. And like That's he, really like, good. Listen, and he's like, sure, go for it. And then, then I'll say, and you know, <laughs> but it, really helps, good. It, takes, it takes a while to get to that point to realize, you know, that that's something that, that happens and that you don't like it. So it's, it's realizing what we want out of the moment because that, that's part of connecting too with another person, right? You know, right. You know, with my kids, sometimes I'll be like, well, you could do this. I don't want to hear that right now. And mm-hmm. you know what? That's something that when, um, if we're out and about and more conventional parents hear that, they think that is like a kid talking back to their parent or whatever, you know, and that's something bad. But no, it's, it's just, um, every, cause then you see where they are, right? You can, you can, right. when they're sharing what they want and don't want or need and don't need in that moment, that's more great information for us to help them in that moment. Yeah. Right? It's not, yeah. not about control. And to go right into problem solving takes away that space that I was talking about yeah. before of letting some of the feelings arise inside of a space of discomfort, of mm-hmm. unknowing, uncertainty, of just that open space of questioning is so valuable. Mm -hmm. And I know myself as a mother, it's so easy for me in my fear to take that space away. Say, I don't ever want you to feel that uncertainty. You want to know what these, what some solutions are or how do you want me to help? But like you said, this is brilliant. If I would just go in and say, do you want me to listen or do you want me to help you problem solve right now? Mm -hmm. Which is most useful for you? Yeah. 
It's beautiful. Yeah. It's that's that is such a great point about that space because we don't I don't want like you were talking about how you don't want your kid your child, you know, to feel sad, upset. You don't want them in that in that space, right? And you don't want to leave them there if they're trying to get out. But there's so much value in learning about being yeah. in that space, right? Um, because they're going to be there, yeah. right? So, so to be able to support their experience of it while they're younger and you're there to help them process through it, because it's going to happen. It happens to, it's life, right? There mm -hmm. are going to be these moments. And to be able to um, be there to support them through it, uh, just to sit with them. Like often support is just sitting beside them. Yeah. And you can feel those feelings. Yeah. And just be there in that moment yeah. of, wow, this hurts my, to watch someone hurting and there's nothing I can do. That hurts. And just let it, let it rise up and um, do what it does, which usually it sort of floats away eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I mean, even my kids know, they'll be like, oh, I'm just going to sleep on it because I know it's going to look better in the morning. But, you know, they're 12 and 13. Don't let me this. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, that's been my experience too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Um, you, uh, you mentioned the documentary a little bit earlier, yeah. which is awesome. Uh, it's, you created it with Nicole Luttrell, and it's called Mop Cap, an alopecia story, which is about your experience of alopecia and self-acceptance. Um, I saw the trailers on, on your website, which I will share in the show notes for people, and I was especially struck by these words. Um, I don't think bald people must be publicly bald to prove a point, but for those of us who are called to do so, it is a kind of love activism. Loving yourself is an act of beauty and it's contagious. Now, those words um, connected deeply with me and reminded me of how it felt and, and continues to feel going about living our unschooling lives, like out in public, just being out there. So I would love to hear how you see your alopecia and unschooling journeys kind of weaving together. I think as I decided to do something with alopecia this round, so I have this long history with alopecia of being a child with alopecia and then um, having an adulthood of passable hair for many years. Um, I think the unschooling for me had me, because I had been immersed in that for the past many years. Mm -hmm. I, I say 13 years, but that's not true. I've had, my oldest is 13 right now, but I think unschooling started when, like really strongly when he was seven years old. Mm -hmm. So it's been really the six years that we've been really immersed in it and me immersed in the philosophy around it. And it's looking at what feels like a problem and finding creative solutions to it. And so for me to do the documentary was this creative solution. It was really for me a project expressing my own unschooling. Like if I was the student, what would I do with this? And I, you know, I would make a documentary film and I got to do it. And it really was um, enriching and informing every aspect of me in this new creative project. And I feel like it informs every creative project that I take on since then mm -hmm. of, okay, there are a lot of ways to do this. Just because I like to dance doesn't mean that I have to dance on stage in front of an audience, that sort of thing of, yeah. of letting myself see things in different ways. And well, how does film come into it? And that changes things. And I think it's just a real richness around everything that comes up in our lives. And so this has become a family um, endeavor now. So even when um, any kind of thing comes up inside of the family, we're all now looking at it from a really different perspective of, okay, there's the conventional way that you might look at this, but we have this other perspective as a family. And we can look at it from another perspective, not from convention, not from how our families did it, and not from how our friends do it. Um, so unschooling really has become something large. It really is a life philosophy. It's so much larger than just an educational model. 
It changes how you approach absolutely everything, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It yeah. really, it, <clears throat> you see so many more aspects to uh, a situation and then the creativity piece, like so often I'll get emails and, you know, people sharing a problem. Um, and it's fun now too, because I've been doing it for so many years and it's just our natural way of looking at life. Like that, well, you know, try this, 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 how <laughs> much of it is, is I think that's one of the big shifts too, is, is we think as parents, we need to solve the problem, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, um, whether it's something that we're fearful about or something that's upsetting our child or whatever, we still feel like we have the responsibility to solve it. Yeah. Now, I don't want to say, you know, I, I don't want that to come across as, no, we have no responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> la, 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 la. Whatever happens, happens. <laughs> no, but, but it's that much bigger perspective that you can bring to it, that creative piece. Well, you know, it's thinking outside of the box. Yeah. And, and so often it's like, well, what, what does your child say? Yeah. You know, what, what do they think? Because one thing I've learned is, is my children um, always have great ideas. And yeah. they were the ones that first taught me to start thinking outside the box because they came up with what, you know, at first we think are crazy kid ideas, but so often they made so much sense. And we actually ended up doing those things. That, that was a, a huge lesson for me when I was de-schooling. Like, children are capable of, of thought and intelligent ideas and just great conversation with you to try and figure out a path forward that 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 was part of the piece that we can live together and do this together and and when things came up it was us all talking like you said right us yeah. all figuring it out together that's mm -hmm. such a it's that that new way of looking at life isn't it <laughs> yeah and in you know adding to what you're saying I realize that the family has this um, sort of a family mind too mm. and so this family mind when given the opportunity and and the opportunity to know each other as well as we do the way we spend time together is that that family mind comes in and solves problems in a way that just one parent or two parents together cannot solve the problem in the same way mm -hmm. just the other day my son Alden was saying um, you know, mom, you have to understand that you and me, we have a very deep center. So people can come and go and it doesn't disturb our center. And I was like, okay, I don't even know what you're talking about, but yes. <laughs> and then he was like, but Maddie and Noah and dad, they have like a shell that needs protecting, that people can't just walk through that space. They've got to have more. And it's like sort of a personal space issue. And it's sort of a, like how much time alone do you need issue. But he was able to pinpoint it at 10 years old in a way that was just beautiful and right on and, and made so much sense. And to hear it coming from him... I could just understand the whole bigger, bigger perspective. Mm -hmm. I just appreciated that so much. And I realized how often we dismiss our children, definitely in society, but how we, we can dismiss them as, oh, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like personal space issues. He knows exactly what we were <laughs> talking about in, in a more beautiful and concise and poetic way. Yeah. So it's like opening those doors of communication and saying, hey, could we all be problem solvers? I mean, I, haven't all of us had these moments when like the two-year-old has the best solution to a problem? <laughs> Let's just eat ice cream. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's what we need to do. <laughs> and you do it once and you're like, you, there's, there's a shift, yeah. right? And then all of a sudden people are talking more, communicating more, and that whole like whatever it was disappeared. Yes. Do these things, people, and, and just see what happens. You know, yeah. doing, doing something once, trying something once doesn't mean that people are going to ask for it forever and ever. It doesn't mean that you're obligated to do the same thing forever and ever. Right. You know, that's what playing and creativity and 
just being open is let's try this like you're unscrolling yeah. magic it let's just try this and see what happens and then everybody's got a little bit more experience to bring next time right right for me it's a lot about curiosity oh, and when you yeah. let curiosity come in yeah. then you let play come in mm -hmm. and you let inspiration come in and it's sort of like depending on how you feel about it you're letting the divine come in when you open yourself to curiosity, when you open yourself to play, mm -hmm. then you don't know where the good ideas are going to come from, yeah. you know? And if you're not sure where there's good ideas, then you can open yourself and be like, it could be here. It could be here. It could be under this rock. It could be in your shoe. I don't know where the good ideas are, yeah, yeah. but let's keep looking. Yeah, yeah. That really is a great way to be with children. Yeah. Oh, I, curiosity has saved my butt like forever. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's what I was thinking about when you, when you first asked me to be on the podcast, I was like, my unschooling life is all about curiosity. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 And, and for me, being curious about unschooling is what has um, made me so fascinated by it. Right. I think that's why I still love talking about it. I still love hearing about it. I, I love diving into it because I'm just curious to see how it unfolds in so many people's lives, right? Because, because it's different everywhere because it's life, right? When you get back and there's to no it. one way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And kids are all different. Uh, one thing I love um, I, that has always helped me with my relationships and connections with my children is that piece where once I understand that my way is completely valid. The way I see things is completely valid and is my way, but it's not the only way. Hmm. Once I got to that point, I could be curious about how they saw things. Yeah. You know, I could still always see, well, I would always know what I would do, you know, in that certain circumstance or whatever, but it's not me anymore, right? We're, we're this big space where we're like all trying to engage and, and live our lives weaving together. And I'm always curious about how they see things. And I learn yeah. so much by hearing how they see things and they see different things and yeah. it opens my mind more. And, and it's just, just a beautiful cycle. <laughs> yeah. When the way someone else sees something doesn't threaten your own way of seeing it, right? Yeah. When we can step away from the fear, then it's only to enhance everything, enhance mm -hmm. the way we are seeing it and add another picture and another facet to something that is, we can't quite see our way all the way around. We really don't know what the truth is, but if we see someone else's picture of it, then it enhances the way we see it. Yeah. What a yeah. great way to describe it. I love that. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful, Anne. All right. Last question. Right okay. now, what is your favorite thing about your unschooling lifestyle with your family? Right now, my favorite thing about my unschooling lifestyle with my family is being able to enjoy summer in Maine. <laughs> Absolutely, fully. We yeah. wait all year to be able to walk barefoot outside yeah. again, <laughs> even though we walk barefoot in the snow sometimes. Um, we have an above ground pool that's an awful lot of fun. And we, right now there are water balloons of different varying temperatures in the pool that we've been experimenting with this morning yeah. and different sizes. And um, so it's still, for me, it's the play. It's a lot of outdoor play and it's a lot of physical hands-on. But, but then Alden was looking at me this morning and he had this giant balloon. He said, mom, I've got this giant balloon full of air, but if I had a smaller balloon, it would weigh the same, wouldn't it? Like he was making these things were happening and he was just blowing up balloons, right? <laughs> so that's always so fun for me to be like, yeah, right? Because is the air going to weigh differently if it's contained in a really big space or in a really small space? Like, let's think about that and let's keep those things going. And um, I can hardly keep up with them sometimes. I know. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that is awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me, Anne. It was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you. That was so much fun. I could do this for hours. I know. So could I. <laughs> Now, before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? You can find me at www.annheadley.com, A-N-N-H-E-D-L-Y.com. And the film is mopcatfilm.com. 
Ah, wonderful. And I will absolutely put all that stuff in the show notes. Thanks Great. so much. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye.